I believe that most men discover their wife is having an affair when they come home at the wrong time. Hearing a careless conversation or finding physical evidence, in my case, was much simpler. My wife sent me an email, in fact, she didn't even write it intentionally, although Freudians might say otherwise. I suppose her email program automatically suggested my name as the intended recipient, and she clicked on it without checking. Of course, it's easy to do, especially when you're in a hurry. Anyway, I was stunned to receive a note from my wife after 18 years of marriage, titled About Yesterday. Since yesterday was a fairly normal Wednesday, I wondered why Anne had emailed me about it. Upon opening the message, I read, Dear, I just wanted to tell you once again how wonderful yesterday was. You made me feel something I hadn't felt in years. I can't wait for next week. Your lady. I was working all day on Wednesday, and to my knowledge, and was too. We didn't even talk on the phone that day, although I remember she was unusually cheerful when she came home in the evening. The disgusting betrayal was evident, and my first thought was to confront her that night and demand an explanation or, more likely, a confession. But I am a logical and methodical person, it didn't take much for me to imagine that she might deny the meaning of the letter, come up with some alternative explanation, or simply dismiss it as a joke. What could I say then? Besides, my baseless accusations would have pushed her away, and I most likely wouldn't have found out anything, after thinking it over, I decided to wait. Firstly, it would be interesting, even amusing, to see if Anne realized her mistake and chose to explain herself. If she didn't, then I had already been warned, and I could use the information about her upcoming rendezvous appropriately. Anne works in real estate, so her work schedules are often irregular. She came home much later than I did that night, and I observed her closely, but her behavior seemed absolutely normal in every way. If she knew the email had been sent by mistake, she didn't show it. I, in turn, didn't even hint that something was amiss. The whole night passed uneventfully, but when we went to bed, I felt sleep eluding me. Instead, I lay there analyzing my problem from every angle to see if I could unravel the mystery doubt of course. There was the possibility that there was a completely innocent explanation for all of this. If that were the case, not only would I look foolish for acting impulsively, but I would also harm our marriage. I love my wife, and the last thing I wanted to do was something that would push her away. Well, if the letter did indeed prove that the affair was underway, then my marriage was already in danger, and in that case, I would have to take action. The next morning, when I arrived at work, I revisited the issue. The following Wednesday should provide some answers. So, I contacted a detective agency and arranged for them to follow my wife. If she does nothing unusual on Wednesday, it won't exactly ease my fears, but I will definitely feel better. However, if my suspicions are justified, at least I will know the truth and can begin taking appropriate steps. Having done all I could at that moment, I put it aside and returned to work, apparently, the next Wednesday was no different from any other. Anne and I, as usual, went to work and came home late at night, almost at the same time. There was nothing in her appearance or behavior that seemed abnormal or unusual to me. I sat in my office, reading my favorite collection of Edgar Allan Poe stories and trying to conceal any signs of anxiety and suspicion. On Thursday morning, I had an appointment with a detective agency to learn the results of their surveillance. Although I am not a very emotional person, I can still read emotions in others. When I entered the office, the detective in charge of my case avoided my gaze. I immediately knew that I wouldn't like what he was going to say. It was just as I feared that my wife left the real estate agency where she works, and the detective followed her to a cheap motel near the airport. He handed me photos of her meeting with a man there and entering a room together. The timestamp on the photo showed 1352, about two hours later. Another photo showed them leaving the room together, holding hands. I'm sorry, the detective said. It's always very unpleasant for us to confirm your suspicions. What would you like us to do now? I thought for a minute. I need your help again, I said. It seems this motel is a regular meeting place. If that's true, is there any way to get photos of what happens inside the room? The detective didn't hesitate. We have a lot of experience in obtaining evidence of this kind. You'll probably have to pay for the cooperation of the motel manager, but if that's acceptable to you, I believe we can guarantee it. I nodded. The evidence would be worth it, I returned to my office, but this time, 
To my surprise, I found that I couldn't concentrate on work. Now that all doubts had disappeared, my ability to think seemed to have vanished. In the end, I stopped trying and focused on what I had learned. Wiping my eyes, I began to make plans. In addition to confirming my wife's infidelity, I understood why and accidentally sent this treacherous letter to me and not to him. It turned out she knew her lover, it was our neighbor Mark Bratzo. Since my name is Mark Bishop, the email program must have suggested my name after and typed the first two letters. It's very careless of her not to double check, I thought. But emotions probably tend to distract lovers. Knowing Ian's lover's identity further increased my sense of betrayal. Mark and his wife, Bobby, were our friends. We often had lunch at each other's homes or went to the movies together, and I never noticed a special spark between Ian and Mark. Was I blind, or were the two skilled in the art of deception? Anyway, I knew I had to do something. The question was what, exactly, for several hours, I mentally went through various courses of action. Sometimes, revenge fantasies crossed my mind, followed by scenarios in which I imagined begging and not to leave. Questions about why the affair started and how long it had been going on haunted me. Anger and self-pity intertwined within me. Finally, I decided not only did I know what I wanted to achieve, but I also had a fairly solid plan to reach my goals. My plan would include two separate courses of action happening simultaneously. I thought of them as divide and conquer, separating two lovers and winning back her heart. As the dividing part of my plan, I would use my knowledge about an and, to some extent, about Mark, to create a rift between them. If I were lucky, I could meddle in their relationship until they decided to break up. The second part would involve a full campaign to regain Anne's love, becoming the perfect husband in the process. When I showed her the downsides of her relationship with Mark, I hoped to demonstrate the benefits of rekindling a relationship with me. I took extensive notes, listing possible actions for each part of my plan, planning their timeline, and elaborating on their interdependencies to complement each other. When I finished, I realized that an essential element for both parts was keeping them in the dark about my knowledge of their relationship. Obviously, this would require self-control on my part, but I felt I could do it. I knew how not to show emotions. I decided not to start my campaign until I received another report from the detective agency. But there were steps I could take during that time to prepare. Firstly, I bought a recording system for our home phones, as well as a voice-activated recording device that I hid in N's car. Intercepting our home phone closed this communication channel. And although I couldn't intercept her mobile phone, I felt the car was the most likely place for her to call Mark. I wasn't worried that she would call him from work, the agency had an open space office, so I reasoned that she was unlikely to have a conversation with her lover in a place where she could be easily overheard. My next step was to access N's email. Her home computer was already set up to access her work email. She protected her system with a password, but I knew where she kept a list of her passwords, and it didn't take me long to gain access. I quickly arranged for copies of all messages to be sent to my address. As soon as I had access to the email, I soon discovered that her affair apparently had only lasted for about a month or so. This suggested that their relationship was still in the honeymoon phase. My task was to end this honeymoon phase as soon as possible. Having completed the preliminary work, all I could do was wait for the detective agency to prepare photos of their next encounter. In addition to the photos, they surprised me by providing video and audio. It was an unpleasant surprise. Gathering courage, I began to watch them making love. What I didn't expect was a display of tenderness and, dare I say it, love between them. The depth of their closeness hurt me. This made me wonder if my plan had a real chance of success. But in the end, I had nothing to lose. I would continue with my planned course of action. My wife is not very patient and doesn't handle disappointments well. I hope to use this weakness against her to disrupt the relationship she had established with Mark. At the same time, she's very romantic, and I felt that this could be an important part of my plan. Having a copy of all her emails gave me an undeniable advantage when it came to planning my intervention program. Her next email exchange provided everything I needed to start the first part of my plan on Wednesday. And absolutely had somewhere she couldn't wait to meet Mark on the day of their next appointment. I drove to Anne's office, parking on the corner so I wouldn't be seen. As soon as she returned from lunch and went inside, I casually walked by her parking spot. I looked around to make sure no one was there, then crouched down next to the car. 
It took me only a minute to unscrew the valve cap of the tire and let the air out. Then I returned to my car and drove back to my apartment. I wondered what she would do without her car at the office that AS expected, 20 minutes before the time she was supposed to meet Mark at the motel, and called me. Can you help me? Don't worry about a thing, honey, I reassure her. Work is pretty light today, so I can fix your car. I just need to finish up one thing here, and then I'll head right over. Of course, I waited another 15 minutes before leaving, which meant I wouldn't arrive at her agency until almost the scheduled meeting time for in and marked I impatiently waited by her car. I'm so sorry for the delay, I apologized. It took longer than I expected. While she walked back and forth in frustration, I changed her tire slowly and methodically. I parked my car right behind hers to load her deflated tire into the trunk and take it for repair. Of course, I also prevented her from leaving until I was done. When I put on the spare tire, I placed the deflated tire in the car and returned after washing my hands. It had been over an hour since she was supposed to meet with Mark. I apologize again for being late, I said, hoping it wouldn't affect her relationship with the client. He just has to understand, she said resignedly. Sometimes these things happen. While I changed her tire, I heard her cell phone ring several times, but even though she checked it, she didn't answer. She probably saw that Mark was calling and didn't want to talk to him in my presence. My suspicions were later confirmed. When I returned to my office and saw a lively exchange between them, an email from Mark said, Where are you? I've been waiting at the motel for over an hour, babe. The car has a flat tire, and replied, I couldn't reach you in his presence. Mark rented a room. Mark, Mac, was here changing the tire. I couldn't talk to you in his presence. Good, I thought, it seems I've disrupted her plans a bit that night. After dinner, I led into the couch, where I placed her feet on my lap and gave her a foot massage. She looked at me curiously because she usually has to ask for it. I know you've had a tough day, honey, and I just wanted to do something nice for you. I said. She glanced at me to see if I was insinuating something more, but when I continued to smile and work on her legs, and relaxed on the couch. Soon, I saw an expression of pleasure on her face, and as I continued the massage, the soft moans of pleasure were sweet music to my ears. Without being intrusive, I waited the rest of the week before taking the next step. On Monday, a large floral arrangement was delivered to her office with a card that read, The Best Wife a Man Can Have. If she felt any remorse due to my irony, she hid it well. But that evening, when she returned home from work, I could see that she was still simmering with anger. However, her nervousness was replaced by surprise when she noticed the dining table was covered with linen napkins and our exquisite china. And when she smelled her favorite dish simmering on the stove, she looked at me with feigned disbelief. Who are you? And what have you done with my husband? She asked with a big smile on her face. Nothing special, I replied modestly. I called your office this afternoon, and when they told me you had a meeting with a client that was running late, I decided the last thing you'd want to do when you got home was cooking. A fleeting fear crossed her face, but she quickly recovered and wrapped her arms around my neck. It's so sweet of you, honey, she said. You treat me so well. After dinner, I was determined not to let her help with the dishes. She looked at me gratefully as I escorted her to the living room and turned on my favorite TV program. When I returned to the kitchen, I felt her eyes following me, and I decided that the conquer part of my campaign was on the right track. Whatever doubts and might have about her affair, the next email I intercepted from Mark made it clear that no temporary setback would deter him. He wanted to savor my wife once again and planned to up the ante to achieve it. Mark said, Okay, no more cheap motels, lady. This time, I've booked a room at the Ad Hotel. Finally, we'll be able to spend quality time together. And agreed, that's much better. See you there at the usual time. Reading their email correspondence, I cursed Mark's persistence and regretted that and was willing to continue her affair. Further measures were required. I waited until noon on the day before their supposed meeting and then called the Ad Hotel's reservation office. I'm Mark Bratso. I have a room reserved for tomorrow, but something has come up, and I won't be able to make it. I'm afraid I'll have to cancel the reservation. No problem, sir, the employee replied. 
In fact, we have a big conference planned, and your cancellation will help us a lot. I smiled satisfied, having done what I had to do. I couldn't resist the temptation to show up just to see what would happen. I sat in a chair overlooking the reception desk and hid behind a newspaper. And indeed, right on time, a married couple appeared, walking hand in hand, chatting and cooing like doves. Their loving mood didn't last long. Once they found out they didn't have a room. But I booked a room a few days ago, Mark yelled at the confused employee. I'm so sorry, the poor girl apologized. But according to my computer, your reservation has been cancelled. It's ridiculous, Mark grumbled. Fine, make us a new reservation. The girl shook her head sadly. I'm sorry, sir, but the hotel is fully booked, and unfortunately, due to the conference in town, most of the other major hotels are also full. But perhaps you'll get lucky at one of the small motels near the airport. When and heard the last comment, her face turned red, and she clenched her fists, while Mark continued to rage at the counter. She tugged at his sleeve angrily. Never mind, she whispered loudly. Let's just get out of here. I'm not in the mood. With these words, she turned and walked toward the parking lot, with Mark following, trying to calm her and offering suggestions. It was clear he wasn't having much luck. I waited for both of them to leave in their cars before leaving my post in the lobby. My job here is done, I thought happily. When and arrived home that night, I stopped her at the door. Don't even bother coming inside the house. We're going. Before she could protest, I took her hand and led her to my car, holding the door open for her. I circled the car and got behind the wheel. What does all this mean? What's going on? She asked. Where are we going? I thought you'd have a little surprise tonight, I said with a smile. With these words, I turned on the car radio with soothing music and continued to drive in silence. She looked at me curiously, trying to guess what I had prepared. Clearly, she was alarmed when she saw me pull into the ad's parking lot. Why are we coming here? She asked nervously. You'll see, I winked at her as we entered the ad hotel's elevator. I pressed the button for the top floor, and soon we were in the rooftop restaurant with its characteristic revolving dome. I approached the maitre d' and gave him my name. Ah, here you are. Right on time, he said. With these words, he led us to a table on the outer edge, where we could admire the city lights. Why did you choose this particular place? And asked suspiciously. No particular reason. Just thought it would be a cool setting for my beautiful wife, I said. She smiled tensely at my compliment. But how did you get a table for us? I heard there's a big convention in town today. Oh, that's not a problem. I said casually. I called today and made a reservation. And didn't react in any way to my comment, but I knew my success sharply contrasted with Mark's fiasco. In fact, I reserved a table as soon as I learned of their meeting plans. I took the liberty of placing the order, I continued. I hope you don't mind. She said she was grateful for my thoughtfulness and relaxed. She was even more pleased when the waiter brought a bucket of ice and a bottle of champagne. After toasting a few glasses that I raised in her honor, she genuinely perked up. And when the waiter brought oysters on the half shell, she was delighted. I'm not a big fan of oysters but and loves them. For the main course, the waiter brought a salmon Nico salad with black olive sauce and was duly impressed. I thought you were going to order something heavy, like a big steak, she said with a smile. This is the perfect choice. I know you like salads, dear, I said. Besides, we don't want to overeat. She looked at me curiously, but I didn't say anything more. For dessert, the waiter brought two bowls of fresh raspberries with a dollop of whipped cream and glasses of Grand Marnia liqueur. It was a perfect ending, and in loved everything. As we were heading back home, and unbuckled her seatbelt and snuggled up to my side. It turned out that the alcohol and oysters had the desired effect. Besides, I felt she should be unsettled and excited after her previous date failures, 
When we arrived home, I led her up the stairs to our bedroom. Why don't you change into your nightgown? I suggested. While I take care of a few things. When she turned to the closet, I hurried down the hallway to the guest room to make sure everything was ready. When I returned, I was pleased to see that she had chosen a sheer black nightgown that both concealed and revealed the curves of her body. I led her down the hallway to the guest room, where scented candles were now burning around the open bed. As she stood there, looking surprised at my preparations, I approached from behind and blindfolded her. Touch and smell will be the only senses you'll need today, I said, leading her to the bed and undressing her to warm her up. I began by massaging her feet. She moaned with pleasure as I gave her a brief foot massage. But this time, I didn't stop there. Soon, I started moving up, paying attention to her calf and thigh muscles to ensure she was completely relaxed. I continued, avoiding her breasts, working on her shoulders and arms instead. When I reached her fingers, I gently turned her onto her stomach and repeated the same process on the back of her legs. I massaged her buttocks and back firmly but not painfully until she moaned with pleasure again. Her moans turned into a long, drawn-out scream, followed by my own grunts, until we both collapsed, exhausted. When I came back to my senses, I removed the blindfold from her eyes. She had her eyes closed. Did she faint or collapse from exhaustion? I took a deep breath, picked her up, carried her to the bedroom, and laid her on the bed. Then I covered her with a sheet, and she quickly fell asleep. I took a quick shower at the sink before returning to BED.AS. I drifted off to sleep. I was very pleased with how the evening had gone. And then I usually had different schedules when we got up for work, but she got up early the next day. When I came downstairs, I saw that she had already prepared coffee and breakfast. Her eyes sparkled when she looked at me. Thank you, dear. Last night was truly something special for me, she said fervently. I'm so glad you enjoyed it, I replied. I know I'll remember this for a long, long time, she smiled. I felt bad and I were making real progress, but later that day, I intercepted an email correspondence that indicated Mark was still trying to meet up with her. I'm really sorry about what happened at the hotel yesterday. I still don't know how they lost my reservation, Mark said. I don't know, Mark, maybe it just wasn't meant to be, and don't say that, lady. Let me make it up to you. Is there any chance you can get away on Saturday? Bobby is leaving town, and we could spend the day at our lake house. No reservation mix-ups, no fire alarm, just passionate love. Max always plays golf on Saturdays. I can probably get away while he's out. Great, I can't wait to touch your hot body again, Mark. It was clear to me that my plan had reached a turning point. I felt that both dividing and conquering were gaining momentum. But I had to do something this weekend, or I would lose everything I had achieved so far. His new plans posed a real problem for me. There's no way to cancel my golf game. And can always pretend to go shopping or come up with some other excuse to get out. I didn't dare touch her car again, everything could be lost if she grew suspicious of me, and unlike the motel and the hotel, I couldn't easily play with Mark's lake house. I needed a way to make and change her plans, preferably at the last minute, suddenly, a stroke of genius occurred to me, the perfect solution. Plus, the preparation only took one phone call. I continued my usual routine for the rest of the week, but on Friday night, I stealthily took in's mobile phone and swapped its battery for a dead one. If she tries to call Mark this weekend, she can only do it through her landline phone, so I can listen in on the conversation not on weekends, and then I dressed quite informally, but on Saturday morning, I noticed with interest that she was wearing a beautiful skirt and blouse as the time for my golf game approached. I could tell and was watching me with some apprehension, probably because I hadn't made any moves to put on my usual golf pants and shirt. When the usual 10 a.m. tee-off time came and I wasn't getting ready to leave, it was clear how the wheels were turning in her head preparing an excuse for why she would eventually get impatient. She turned to me. You're not going golfing today. What's going on? She demanded. And at that moment, the doorbell rang. And looked confused and went to see who was there. As she opened the door, she exclaimed in surprise, Miriam, what are you doing here? That's how you greet your younger sister, Miriam said as she walked in. The women embraced excitedly. Of course, I'm glad to see you, and murmured. Just didn't expect you. Miriam smiled at me. I'm here because your wonderful husband invited me. 
He called me earlier this week to let me know you didn't have plans and offered to spend the weekend together. It's been so long since we've seen each other that I took this opportunity. Anne and Miriam were very close. They spoke on the phone every week, but since Miriam lived 200 miles away, they didn't visit each other often. It's wonderful to have you here, and told her. Then she turned to me. That's great, Mac. Now I understand why you're not playing golf. Well, there's nothing more important than giving my wife the opportunity to spend time with her sister, I said. And now, dear, I want you to get ready because I'm treating you both to breakfast. Then I looked at them again. Actually, Miriam, you might want to change into something fancier than your jeans. Oh, you look great just as you're dressed now. And looked at herself and blushed, remembering why she was dressed that way, but she quickly composed herself. Why don't you help Miriam take her bag to the guest room while she changes? I'll just make a quick call. I watched her walk down the hallway, and a minute later, I heard muffled curses. She came out with her inoperable mobile phone in her hands. It's run out of battery, she said angrily. Oh, dear, what a shame, I expressed my sympathy. Well, you can use your landline phone. Anyway, it doesn't matter, she said hastily. In any case, the call isn't that important. Now, where are we going to have breakfast? I spent the rest of the weekend having a good time with my sisters, trying to make them feel comfortable. When Miriam left on Sunday afternoon, she hugged me and thanked me. By the way, you have a special husband, she told in. I thought and shuddered slightly, but then she smiled and hugged me. That's right, she promised. I was sure and had taken advantage of the weekend to call Mark, but I wasn't worried if the call was made on our landline. I have a recording. After she went to bed on Sunday night, I was able to review the recording device. Of course, the call was early on Sunday morning. And, where have you been? You didn't show up on Saturday, and every time I tried to call you, your phone went straight to voicemail. I'm sorry, but there was nothing I could do. My sister unexpectedly arrived in town on Saturday morning, and my phone was dead. I haven't had a chance to talk to you until now. Couldn't you have left on Saturday afternoon? I couldn't. Mark took us all around the city on Saturday, and today, my sister came for the weekend. I just can't leave her. We haven't seen each other in months. Well, I feel stupid sitting at the lake house all day waiting for you. You never think of anything but yourself, Mark. Okay, I guess it's clear how important I am to you. And, let's not fight about this. Listen, I have to go. Their conversation delighted me, it seemed like her disappointment was about to overflow, and I felt I had dealt a severe blow to their relationship. One might expect this to be enough. After checking her emails on Monday, I found confirmation of my assessment. Are we still meeting this week, right? I don't think so, Mark. This is all getting very troublesome, and it's starting to bother me. Plus, Mac has been very kind to me lately, and I feel quite guilty about seeing you behind his back. I think we need to put an end to this. Don't say that, Anne. At least one more time. I'm not joking, it's over. Well, I can't say I'm not disappointed. You're still an attractive woman, but I understand what you're saying. Maybe it's for the best. I don't want to lose Bobby either. But I hope we can still be friends. And, of course, we'll still be friends. Just not friends with benefits. Success. I managed to introduce enough problems into their relationship for it to collapse. Now, I just had to complete the second part of my plan. When Anne returned home that night, she was sullen and distracted. A couple of times, I even thought I saw tears in her eyes. I didn't want to interfere, but I felt I shouldn't completely ignore her behavior. Are you okay, honey? I asked solicitously. You seem in a bad mood today. Are you having trouble at work? It's fine, she responded without looking at me. I guess I'm just in a bad mood. Maybe it's hormones or something. I nodded and gave her time to recover, but secretly, 
I rejoiced because I was sure she was regretting the end of her relationship with Mark. Even though it was her decision to end the affair, I knew and invests a lot of emotions in any relationship and can't just walk away from it without feeling a certain loss. For me, her mood was reassuring, she wouldn't feel so sad if she hadn't decided to end the relationship. But I couldn't help but think that Mark probably wouldn't have a similar reaction. He's probably sleeping with Bobby right now, I thought sarcastically. The next morning, and was in a much better emotional state. Throughout the day, I didn't see any more letters between Mark and her, which strengthened my confidence that neither of them had changed their minds. I had a growing sense of triumph, everything was going as planned. That night, after dinner, when it entered the study, I had another Edgar Allan Poe book on my lap. What are you reading this time? She asked. It's one of my favorites, I said. It's the cask of Amontillado. I don't know it, she said, then snuggled up beside me. Can I interrupt you for a minute? I just wanted you to know how wonderful my husband is, she said earnestly, looking me in the eyes. You've been so kind to me in the past few weeks, and I feel very lucky to have you. My heart soared at these words, and I realized I had one. This is the moment I've been waiting for. I looked at her, waiting for her to say more. She paused, and for a moment, I saw a guilty expression cross her face. Her eyes seemed to moisten slightly. Reem, I don't deserve you, she said fervently. No, I said calmly, I don't deserve you. Then I reached into the desk drawer, and certainly, I didn't deserve her, I said sharply, tossing photos of her encounter with Mark at the motel into her lap. At first, she looked confused due to the change in my tone, and then she barely grasped what I had given her. But when she focused on the photos and realized what they represented, she started sobbing. Oh my god, no, she sobbed. Then I handed her a copy of the divorce petition my lawyer had filed the day before. When she realized what I had given her, her breath caught. But I thought, you and me, I mean, is there any way? I didn't interrupt her, coldly handing her another stack of papers. And in case you're interested in Mark, here's a copy of the letter I sent to Bobby tonight, along with the detective's report. I also sent a similar letter to your sister Miriam, explaining why I'm divorcing you. She groaned in pain and sobbed again. I just don't understand. You've been so loving and attentive all these weeks. I can't believe you're so cruel. At this point, all of this means nothing, my dear, I told her equanimously. When you started your little romance, you ended all my love for you. That's why I spent the last few weeks trying to end your relationship with Mark. As for how I treated you, well, I wanted to make sure you understood how much you lost when you betrayed me. My goal was to take away the same things you took from me, and as far as I can see, my plan worked perfectly and collapsed on the couch, sobbing pitifully. Before leaving, I placed the Poe book I was reading on top of the rest of the documents, the text was open to the cask of Amontillado, and I used a marker to highlight the passage containing the family motto, No one insults me with impunity. Story 2 I, a 32-year-old male, was married to my ex-wife, a 29-year-old female, for three years. We were madly in love but unfortunately, our marriage couldn't work because of her infidelity. The first time my ex-wife and I met was on a dating site. At that time, I was desperately looking for someone to settle down with because I was tired of being lonely, and she came around at the right time. After meeting each other physically for the first time, we had more dates, and as we got to know each other better, we fell deeply in love, our relationship started as a very beautiful one. We used to hang out every weekend, spend quality time with each other, and do fun stuff together. However, after about a year of dating my wife, I noticed she had anger issues. At first, her anger issues started as nagging and making mountains out of molehills. Then it got so bad that she would break stuff whenever she was angry. Once she became calm again, she would apologize and cry for forgiveness. When I noticed this bad attribute, I wanted to break up with her, but each time she begged me, I would forgive her, only for the same thing to repeat itself. There was even a time I was so close to breaking up with her because she had an altercation with my mom when she came to visit me. 
but because she had enrolled in anger management classes and I saw a bit of improvement, I forgave her. All this while, I didn't know I was shooting myself in the leg, and marrying her was one of my mistakes. When most people tell stories of how they enjoyed the first years of their marriage, I can't relate to that because the first two years of my marriage were filled with fights and arguments. My wife had multiple personalities. One day she would be all loving and lovely, the next day she would be so angry over little things she shouldn't be angry about. Aside from the anger issues my wife had, she was a sweet and hard-working wife. She took care of me and my needs, and the house too. She also worked for a big organization in the town we lived in, so in terms of finances, she was earning more. Despite earning more, we split the bills equally, and we both took care of our responsibilities. I think I kept holding on to my wife and believed she would change because she was putting in a lot of effort to be a better person, and I wanted to support her. I also knew she grew up in a toxic and abusive environment, and how she was raised contributed greatly to her anger issues. Whenever she did something terrible or broke something, I wanted to leave her, but I couldn't. We had a lot of beautiful memories together, and I didn't want to judge her based on her bad side alone. She also kept telling me that I was the only guy who had stuck with her in both the good and bad times. None of her relationships worked in the past because all the men she dated kept leaving her, and I wanted to be the good husband who would stick to his marital vows of for better or for worse. Fortunately, the relationship between my wife and me started getting better in the third year of our marriage, months after our second anniversary. I noticed that the relationship between my wife and me had improved so much. She no longer argued and fought over everything, which was a big step up for us. Initially, I thought that she was getting better at controlling her anger because of the new therapy she was getting. Also, it didn't just stop with the improvement in our communication. My wife began to act like a totally different person. For example, she often complained about work when she returned from the office, but that changed. Instead, she would come home and tell me how she was finally getting along with her colleagues in her organization. Aside from that, she became more cheerful, and everything seemed to change about her, honestly speaking. All the changes I noticed for months were because of her anger management therapy sessions. I even went as far as dropping a great review and a 5-star rating on her therapist's website. It felt so good to have peace in my marriage and hold a conversation for a whole day without dishes being thrown out of happiness. I even told my friends about her improvement, and they were so happy for me. On the other hand, when my wife's anger issues improved, she became so engrossed with work. Around the same time, which did not allow us to get as close as I wanted. Despite her busy work schedule, I never complained because it was better for her to be calm and engrossed with work than constantly fighting and complaining about work. While I was innocently and wholeheartedly happy for my wife, I didn't know she was doing the unthinkable behind my back. The day I found out, I returned home, and my parrot started saying a name I didn't know. Our parrot was good at picking up new names or anything that sounded like a name. So when I heard that name, I suspected that someone had visited our house, and he must have heard someone call the name. When I asked my wife about it, she insisted that he must have gotten the name from the television. That did not sit well with me, mainly because when I tried to argue that my parrot couldn't pick the name from a movie, she flipped for the first time in a long while and walked out on me. The moment she walked out in anger, I suspected that something was going on. I thought someone must have visited our home, and my wife didn't want me to know about it. So I decided to find out. In the following days, I bought a small-sized camera and hid it in my parrot's cage to confirm my suspicion. The next day, I told my wife I was traveling to the nearby state to visit my mom, but I was staying at a friend's house that same evening. As I stayed at my friend's house to watch my house, I saw something that shattered my heart and destroyed our marriage. I watched as my wife came in with one of her organization's new interns, and they engaged in intimate activities on her couch, right in front of the bird and the camera. Before I found out my wife was cheating on me, I told my friends about my parrot and the strange male name they kept saying, but they said I was paranoid and my parrot might have heard the name from a movie. My wife flipped and walked out on me because I was annoyed. It would be an understatement to say I was disappointed, shattered, and devastated. I could not believe that the same woman I tolerated her anger issues and stood by her on the days I should have been out there breathing fresh air was cheating on me with an intern. It felt like a bad dream I needed to wake up from, but sadly, it was my harsh reality. About two days after I learned about my wife's infidelity, my broken state turned to anger and I thought of ways to pay her back. 
Finally, I had something, and I knew destroying all her years of hard work and commitment to her organization would be a major hit for her. So I sent the video footage to her company, and I was sure they would take action. I returned home a week later because I wanted to cool off and put myself together. When I eventually got home, I met my wife at home. She had been fired by this time, and the intern had been dismissed. When I asked my wife why she wasn't at work, she said her company was downsizing, so they had to let her go immediately. She said that with a smile, and I told her I knew why she was fired. She was confused and didn't understand what I meant. Before I went home, I had already contacted a divorce lawyer to start processing our divorce. So I told my wife I was behind the video sent to her organization, and at the snap of a finger, she flipped and started yelling at the top of her voice. She said she was glad she cheated on me because I was a weak man and I didn't satisfy her in bed, so she had to make herself happy. What an excuse. When she said that, my anger level skyrocketed, and before she had the opportunity to start throwing things at me as usual, I pulled her with strength and threw her out of my house. She made a scene outside, and after she was tired of yelling, she took the few things I had thrown out and left. A few days later, she started calling my phone nonstop and sent multiple messages saying that she was a changed person and would never cheat on me again. I'd be stupid if I gave her another opportunity. We eventually divorced, and I have been living my best life since then. I never thought I'd say this, but I feel more at peace without my wife. It's almost like I've been let out of an invincible cage, and I feel so relieved. I do not miss my ex-wife, and I'm so glad things turned out that way. Otherwise, I might still be stuck in our marriage, hoping that she would evolve into the kind of woman I wanted. One thing I've learned the hard way is to never try and save people like my wife because you will drown in the process of saving them. As for my precious parrot, I'm glad he helped me get out of that terrible marriage. Now none of my friends doubt my parrot anymore. OP, no one should ever be in a toxic or manipulative relationship. Sadly, your wife cheated on you even when you tolerated her excesses and stood by her. She manipulated you the whole time while you were blinded by love. Did she think calling you a weak man would get to you after she betrayed you that way? That's funny. Anyways, it's good that you have broken out of her chains of manipulation. Enjoy your life now, do what you love, and prioritize your peace of mind.